You have both received <laughs> numerous awards and accolades for your triumphant one-man shows. Ian, you for acting Shakespeare, and Patrick, you for A Christmas Carol. Let's hear for both of them. What has given each of you the most joy and satisfaction with these two shows? I, I was coming to play uh, Salieri in, in uh, Peter Schaffer's Amadeus, and uh, the, 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 one of the challenges of that part is that uh, the whole <coughs> play is told through his uh, memory of, of uh, his life with Mozart, uh, and he talks to the audience incessantly. And I thought, oh, God, I'm going to New York. I'm going to pretend to be uh, an 18th century Italian in a town that knows about what it is to be Italian. And I'm going to have to, <laughs> going to, have to talk to them all evening long. Uh, I better get some experience of, of this talking to an audience. And that's, so I decided to, I put together a one-man show and took it around to a lot of foreign countries where they didn't speak English in, in, in Europe. <laughs> And at the end of that, I thought, oh, I can deal with playing Salieri now in, in New York. Um, that's why I did. What was the most rewarding thing about it? Oh, God, I had a wonderful time in that show. I did it over about 15 years in all sorts of places. That's the thing about that. <clears throat> you know, one, one actor in a chair, yeah. you can do it anywhere, anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I did. I did it in, in school rooms and lecture halls and big theatres, small theatres. And yep. you for a Christmas carol. Yes, um, it, it gestated over such a long period from being asked to do a reading in my parish church back in the small town I grew up in for the organ restoration fund. And I had um, not known what to do except that I was filming um, in Derbyshire and one morning waiting to be called on the set, sitting in my hotel, and it was raining outside, and I knew they were outdoors, and it was ghastly. I took down the thinnest volume in the hotel bookshelf, which proved to be A Christmas Carol, and I thought, oh, Lord, I know this story. I've read it. So I turned the pages and found, of course, I had never read it, and I read it. I read it through the morning, through my, with my soup at lunchtime, finished it in the afternoon, weeping hopelessly at the end of it, unaware of the great power of the story. So then I read it in my parish church and didn't cut it enough, and people sat on hard wooden pews for three hours while I droned on <laughs> reading this thing. But I thought, wow, there's something in this. So then it developed into a read performance and then finally into a learnt performance and, and, and four times on Broadway and twice in the West End. I think it was um, introducing people to a version of A Christmas Carol that they probably had never seen before, with all its harshness and cruelty and social divisions and selfishness and greed. It's not just uh, poor old uh, um, Scrooge. Scrooge, thank you. Well, we have to get into some of your film work. The two of you have been connected to some of the most successful film franchises and roles in the history of cinema. Star Trek, X-Men, The Lord of the Rings, and The Hobbit. <laughs> Was it easy to say yes to the first X-Men film, and did either of you have any trepidations? Said no. Why? <laughs> um, because it was some years after uh, uh, what was that other show? Star Trek. Star Trek, Star Trek had finished. <laughs> and, um, and I had not long come out of a director's office, a director I had been passionate to meet, to pitch myself for a quite nice supporting role in a movie, and had a lovely meeting with him, but it ended up with him saying to me, but tell me, why would I want Captain Picard in my movie? Yeah. And when... I was told, I said, no, I've got one glorious albatross around my neck. I don't need two. I'm sorry, but thank you. I won't. And, uh, but I agreed to have lunch with Brian Singer, and, um, and I said yes. Because he, he persuaded me that it was going to be a different experience altogether, and it was. So, sure. Yeah, but I said Ian, no. for you, you had worked with Brian before in Apt Pupil. That I, was pretty, I was pretty keen to, to yeah. uh, late in my career, uh, have some decent parts in films. And uh, none of that wouldn't have 
happened and unless I'd made a film of my own, really, uh, Richard III, which I, I adapted from Brilliant. the stage production. <laughs> and, you know, I, uh, that was... Uh, that sort of proved that I, c I could be trusted in front of a camera, which I think people had doubted before, because I was busy playing to the people over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Bri Brian Singer, uh, who had just done The Usual Suspects, create a claim, asked to see me, having seen my film of Richard III, in which I played a, a sort of Nazi version. And he was casting a Nazi in, in uh, Apt Pupil, that we did with Brad, Brad Renfro. And as, he, as I sat down, he said, oh, he said, I thought you were older than you. Oh, you're too young to play the part. Oh, what a pity, he's an old man. I said, that one's fine, that one's fine. And we started to talk about this and that. He said, have you seen uh, John Schlesinger's latest movie? Uh, uh, Cold Comfort Farm. I said, uh, yes, I have seen it. <laughs> oh, it's great, isn't it? Yes, I thought it was good. Yes. He said, who's the, who's the old guy who plays the preacher in that? <laughs> I said, that was me. <laughs> he said, you can play old. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> so he cast me in Apt Pupil. Uh, <laughs> And having done that, uh, he then said uh, he's going to do... He discovered these comics, which he'd never read before. A friend of uh, DeSanto introduced him to him. And he sold it entirely to me. Not that I, not that I had any snobbery about doing a comic. I mean, I, I'm, I've got very Catholic tastes in storytelling. Uh, you know, it can be anything. Uh, I, I, I don't... Because something's popular doesn't mean to say it's not any good. Um, and he said, uh, the, the dilemma that mutants find themselves in, in an alien society, is mirrored by the dilemma that goes right through the civil rights movement, which is, what do you do if society rejects you? Do you, with Magneto and Malcolm X, pick up arms and challenge society violently if necessary, or do you as Martin Luther King would advise, and, and Professor X, um, stand up for your rights uh, uh, and, and try and fit in and to help society by being yourself and, and integrate. Well, uh, having just been involved in the gay rights movement in, in the UK, I, I knew about this dilemma, and I'm firmly on the side of Professor X. And uh, he, he said... Marvel said that the, the demographic for the comics, and I wonder if it's true of the films, it, uh, the, the readers are uh, young blacks, young Jews, and young gays, and they think of themselves as mutants because they've been taught mm. that they're mutants. So it was a political act, really, uh, that uh, I got involved in X-Men. As for, as for Gandalf, you know, I, I'm, I, anybody can play Gandalf. It's, there's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, that's the, I, I love being Gandalf. I love playing Gandalf. I'm very grateful to Peter Jackson and everything about all that. My life has been changed totally because of it. But I can't take really much more credit than um, saying, all right, I will sit here for 40 minutes while you stick on the beard, which is the... <laughs> Put on the nose, put on the wig, put on the hat, give yourself a voice, and you're off. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But you know it's true. I mean, who, who could ever replace uh, <clears throat> Richard... Um, Harris. Who? Harris. Yes, thank you. Richard Harris as Dumbledore. Well, the man died. They had to replace him. Does anyone realize now that it hasn't always been Mike Gambon? If I told you it was John Hurt in, in, in the Hobbit movie and it wasn't me at all, you'd, you'd think for a second.
But that was unheard of at the time. I mean, he made, you, you shot those three films all at the same time. I mean, I don't think anything had been done like that before. When he pitched that to Peter Jackson, you were like, I'm going to be going Well, it was away. a year's work. Yeah. And that was a bit of a stunner. Did I want to go and live in New Zealand for a year? Well, as it turned out, I was very happy that I did. I mean, I, I, yeah. can't, I can't recommend New Zealand strongly enough. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Quite unlike Western the world. It's in the Southern Hemisphere, and it's far, far away. And although they speak English, don't be fooled. They're, they're, they're not like us. They are <laughs> they're something better than us. I think. But it must have been nice for the two of you to revisit these characters in X-Men for the new one that's coming out. I think it was, yeah. <laughs> um, we are quite isolated in this movie. So Ooh, that's a very good word. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking more marginalized. Yeah. <laughs> that may be more realistic and pragmatic. <laughs> But um, we were the first on the set. We, we shot for the first four weeks of what was to be a, what, a five-month shoot. Oh. Um, God help them. And they shot us out because we had other things to do, in fact. Um, and I enjoyed it. I've always been a company man from the very beginning. Yeah. I wanted to work with groups of actors over a period of time. Well, Star Trek gave me that for seven years of a TV series and another six, seven years of four movies. And X-Men has it too. Only this time now, in addition to finding ourselves back in the, in the company of, of Hugh and Halle and so forth, we now have a whole new group of actors too who are playing our other selves or younger selves. I'm not giving away anything I'm not supposed to talk about, am I? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> it all stays here. But for us, this is really, it was, we have to thank X-Men for the two of us really getting to know one another because every day on an X-Men movie, you spend far more time sitting in your trailer than you do in, on the set doing a job of work. And those trailers are extremely luxurious. <laughs> and we had adjoining ones, so we sat around and talked and reminisced. And I discovered a lot about this chap and he about me. And we found that there were many, many overlaps in our careers and many uh, areas where we had little in common. And, uh, and, and so we have uh, Brian Singer and uh, Lauren Shula Donner and Marvel Comics yeah. to thank for that. And Stan Lee, of course. Yeah. Mm. You two are so part of pop culture. I mean, there are action figures, dolls, <laughs> games, books, sheets, clothes. What is that like for you? Is it, is it cool? Is it overwhelming? I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I've always, it was, no, not always, it, it, but it is, it's intriguing to be part of the culture. Yeah. But you can't take any credit for it. You know, it, it's X-Men that's part of the culture, it's Tolkien that's part of the culture. Mm. There, were, there were buttons, you know, um, Gandalf for president, uh, <laughs> before most of you here were born. It's, uh, I, I've arrived in Tolkien quite late in the day. The films follow on from the great success of the books, and the same with the... With the the comics and the X-Men films. But it's just, it, it just amuses me. It tickles me. I, I, I look in a shop window and say, oh, there I am. It, <laughs> and uh, I, I can't take any credit for it. It wasn't my idea I'd be made into a, a, a doll whose head did that. <laughs> Patrick, for you. Well, um, I, what happened to me was the shock of uh, Star Trek. And I think it is now common knowledge, it's out there, that, that the only person who advised me not to do it is sitting on my left <laughs> here, um, just a few days before I signed up. Actually, no, I was in the process of making the decision. I had five days to make up my mind. Um, and that, like Lord of the Rings, Ian, changed my life. Every single corner of it has not been unaffected by that. No, the big surprise for me, the thing that occasionally 
makes me start and wonder if, as I say in both plays, am I asleep, is that my stage work should be where it is now. I, I never expected that to happen. Mm. And it has partly happened because of Star Trek. I launched Christmas Carol on Broadway. The first week, we sold the week to Star Trek fan clubs. <laughs> and then the review came out and everything was fine. So um, I have my present theater career in part to thank for, to thank to X-Men and to Star Trek. And that I get to spend six nights a week and three afternoons on stage with this chap is still of <laughs> Because I was a fan. You don't, you, 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 you don't think of Sir Patrick Stewart as being lovable, do you? But I do. <laughs> <laughs> He's lovable. Maybe they do think of you. No. <laughs> <laughs> they might want to make love to you, but that's different. <laughs> <laughs> well, on a personal note, I want to talk about your charity work because what you each do is tremendous. You have touched hundreds of thousands of people with what you do through your charity work. Ian, in 1988, you came out and become a role model for gay rights all around the world. You helped co-found the organization Stonewall. How has doing that and coming out changed your life and your career? Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I've said it before, but it's quite a good line. On my gravestone, it'll say, here lies Gandalf, he came out. <laughs> um, well, anyone who here is, is, is gay will, will know. Uh, we have an extra responsibility in our lives, uh, thrust on us by society. Uh, we have to uh, face the possibility of coming out. Straight people don't have, the, don't have that. It's, it's the only advantage of being gay, is you, you have to come out. Uh, and in doing that, your life has changed entirely for the better. I've never met a gay person who didn't think that. But I was 49. 49. Everybody who I'd ever met knew I was gay, with the exception of uh, my stepmother and my sister, and other members of my blood family who I never talked about it, and the media, uh, who had never asked me was I gay, and I'd never ventured the information. And everybody else knew, my friends, <coughs> my employers, my employees, wasn't an issue. Which is perhaps why I didn't get involved earlier in, in the gay rights movement. I mean, Stonewall, the riots here passed me by. I didn't read gay press. I, I didn't think there was an issue because there wasn't really an issue for me. Except, of course, there was. <laughs> I hadn't told my stepmother. Who, when I did come out to her, said, oh, we, and I've known that for 30 years. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, you, uh, coming out at last means you are yourself. You can be yourself. Mm. And my acting changed overnight, I'm told. Didn't feel like that. But you see, up to that point, anything emotional in my life uh, was uh, a dangerous area. I couldn't hold hands with somebody I liked or loved. I couldn't uh, be affectionate to them in public because that was against the law. It might be thought to cause offense to passers-by. It's the same as the new law just passed in Russia if, you would, if I were to hold hands with my beloved in, in Moscow uh, in, and was spied by anyone under the age of 18, I could be put in prison for 10 years. It's a wicked world. Well, I grew up in such a world. And, and what happened when I came out, on the advice of Armstead Maupin, the author of Tales of the City, the millstone that I hadn't known was there fell. And the block that I hadn't known was there about the diaphragm dispersed 
It's like a, 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 a miracle healing on, from some evangelist. Ow! Ow! <laughs> I see where the, the, there can be some truth in those uh, theatrics. And when I said I was gay, uh, I was confident. I was immediately happy. Many, many people uh, thanked me. Uh, some people wrote death threats, and I didn't mind because I knew they were absolutely in the wrong. And I felt for the first time absolutely that I was in the right because I was being myself. And Patrick, you have helped countless numbers of people with your involvement in domestic abuse protection, which is so important through the organization Refuge and Post Traumatic Stress Disorder through Combat Stress. What these two organizations have meant to you personally and how it's changed your life. Um, if, if, if I could just add my moment of coming out, because although much more much less significant than what Ian has been describing, which was fantastic to hear that, Ian, and for everybody. Um, I started losing my hair when I was a teenager. And, and so um, I wore hats, caps, all the time. I always had my head covered up, but I also had an elaborate comb over. <laughs> um, and there are somewhere, there are photographs still floating around of this thing over my head. <laughs> And I'd been at drama school with a wonderful, a, a, a Hungarian refugee from 1956 who was much older than the rest of us, uh, George Kishvalvi. And uh, I, a few years after I'd been out in, in the professional theater, I went to have lunch with him and his wife. And after we'd had lunch, and I thought the two of them were in the kitchen getting coffee ready, I was sitting in my chair with the Sunday newspapers, and suddenly my arms were grabbed from behind. George was a black belt judo man. And he was pinning my, and I said, well, what, the, what are you up to? And then his wife appeared in front of me with a pair of shears. <laughs> and I knew what she was going to do, and I screamed, screamed, and she lifted up my hand, she cut it off. And then <clears throat> George came round, never letting me go, came round in front of me and was gripping me, and he said, No more hiding! You be yourself! Mm. And it was a great, great thing he did. Wow. Um, No more hiding. <laughs> no more hiding. And that's what being on a stage means to me now as much as possible. No more hiding. Um, my mother was a victim of domestic violence. My father was a, a, a remarkable and fine man, brilliant and brave soldier, but a weekend alcoholic. And at weekends, he lost control. So uh, I saw, witnessed from the age of about seven horrible things in my house, and I could do nothing except occasionally try and put my body between theirs, but nothing else for my mother. And I heard doctors and ambulance men say who were called, and policemen, well, she must have done something to provoke him. Mm. Say. My mother never did anything. Um, and so when I was given an opportunity about 12 years ago to work for Refuge, which is the primary domestic violence charity in the UK and an extraordinary organization, I leapt at it because I saw here at long last was a chance to do something for my mother and those who are experiencing what she experienced. But out of all this, my father began to get publicly a worse and worse reputation, and I always began to feel slightly guilty about this, and I would talk about the other qualities in him. For instance, I have been channeling my father in my acting for years. And then on camera, two years ago, making a film for the BBC called Who Do You Think You Are? where the subject is not told which of his ancestors they're going to be telling, discovering for him until the camera is rolling. So it's two weeks of <laughs> discovery. It proved to be my father, not some distant ancestor. And sitting on some stone steps of a church above the, the Seine, um, one April afternoon, the man who was talking to me gave me a newspaper cutting and said, read this here, and it said, Sergeant Alfred Stewart has returned home. He was in the British Expeditionary Force, calamitously defeated in 1941, who experienced horrendous things, but he was on the last boat out of Cherbourg, has returned home severely shell-shocked. So I read this on camera, and I'm reading information I never knew. Mm. We now call it PTSD. And when finally I got to talk to an expert on this, which we also did in the film, he said, what you have told me about your father's drinking, the, the violence, uh, his depressions, 
All of these are classic symptoms. And because it was 1941, he would never have had treatment. He would have probably been told, pull yourself together and act like a man. Nobody ever talked about it. He didn't talk about it. Your father went to his grave with PTSD. So I joined that organization as a patron. So now I do the same work for my father that I've been doing for my mother. And it makes me happy. My final question, gentlemen, for you is, what is the best bit of advice that you've been given that you still live by? <laughs> principal of my drama school, Duncan Ross, who went on to become principal at, uh, at, uh, director at Seattle Rep and the Seattle um, School, said to me in my last months, called me to his office and gave me a serious talking to, but he ended up the, um, the, the, the interview with the following words, Patrick, you will never achieve success by insuring against failure. Mm. And it took me, well, until the winter's tale to work out what he meant by it. What did he mean by it? Um, he meant, unless you risk yes. everything recklessly, carelessly as an actor, not carelessly, but recklessly, certainly, and if you if you take the chance of exposing that which is most personal and private, then you might possibly be successful. Otherwise not. Ian, for you. Well, I, I didn't go to drama school, where I suppose you're given lots of a good, good advice. <laughs> uh, my drama school, I suppose, was the first jobs I had, and, and the first theatre I worked in was in the uh, Midlands in the UK, in Coventry where there was a local repertory theatre uh, financed by the Arts Council of Great Britain and the local authority, uh, and uh, we did a different play every two weeks in a custom-built theatre, first theatre built in the UK since the war. And the leading lady, Sheila Keith, and the leading man, Bernard Kilby, were both... They should have been working in the West End. They should have been in the putative national theatre, which didn't exist at that time. They were very good actors. But they had, both of them in the past, uh, not paid enough tax. And the crunch had come. You either pay so much a week on the nail, or you go to prison. So they were both holding down a job which uh, they were too good for. Well, I got a bit of advice from both of them. On my very first performance, I was uh, in, in the, our production of um, uh, uh, Man for All Seasons. I was playing his son-in-law. And uh, the man playing the king, Henry VIII, uh, spied the ring I was wearing. I'd, I'd kept it on from Cambridge, I some production. He said, could he borrow it? Because he didn't have a ring to wear as the king. So I said, fine. And he went on, and when he came off, I thought, I want my ring back, because I want to go on to the stick. Where is he? I couldn't find him. I couldn't find the ring. And I heard over the time, Ian McKellen, uh, you're off. I didn't know what that meant. Well, it meant I was off the stage, and I should be on the stage. Uh, and someone said, get down there. And I just raced down the stairs at the end of the scene that I should have been in, and all the actors were coming on, and effortlessly, of course, they'd covered for me and said all my lines, and uh, the audience wouldn't have noticed any difference. Well, after t my first performance ever as a professional actor, I was mm. off. <laughs> and Sheila Keith, wise bird, sat me down with half a pint of beer and said, Ian, every actor is off once in his career. Aren't you lucky to have got it over with so ah. soon? <laughs> <laughs> That was a bit of a bad, um, uh, alas, uh, uh, it isn't the last time I've been off, but, uh, the, but then Bernie, after the show, can you imagine, we, we, you rehearse from 10 in the morning till 6 at night, you do the show and then you go home to learn, but there was always that magical hour or two when you could go to the pub, they, they, mm -hmm. it was after hours and it was closed up and it was just the actors in there, and the police of course who dropped by. <laughs> uh, and I was always trying to buy Bernie a drink, because I adored him and admired him, and, and uh, he was 
playing Thomas More in that production. He'd never let me buy him a drink. He said, Ian, I can afford to buy you a drink, and you can't really afford to buy me one. He said, but will you just drink it? And, and remember, when you can afford to buy the other actors a drink, will you do it for me? And three months later, we were doing um, an Agatha Christie play. It used to be called Ten Little Niggers, then it became Ten Little Indians, then it became, and then there, were, there was one, I think. Then there was one. Mm. And the characters died one by one, and he, he was playing the villain. And he had to fall over the sofa, and in doing that during the show, he ruptured his inside, and the next day died. God. Bernard Kilby. But he's still alive in me, because uh, you'll find if you're ever uh, in a company with me, uh, and you're younger than me, I'll, I'll be buying you a drink. <laughs> <laughs> <I'll hold you>. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I have done this for close to 25 years, and I want to tell you, gentlemen, thank you. This has been one of the most magical afternoons oh, and one of the best interviews 